Very good. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> My name is David Mulvihill, and on behalf of the Chicago Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy, I would like to welcome you to this evening's program, Cocktails and Crypto, hosted by our moderator, Patrick Doherty, uh, here at the Chicago offices of Foley and Lardner LLP. Uh, I would also like to welcome our live stream audience this evening, uh, joining us on the Federalist Society YouTube channel. Uh, before I introduce Pat, uh, I am obliged to provide our customary and very important advertisement for the Society. Uh, founded in 1982, the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies is a group of conservatives and libertarians dedicated to reforming the current legal order. We are committed to the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is and not what it should be. The society seeks to promote awareness of these principles and to further their application through its activities. The Chicago Lawyers Chapter of the society is active in promoting this mission through programs like the outstanding panel we have for you this evening. I'd also like to bring to your attention a couple of upcoming programs that may be of interest. On Thursday, May 18th, we have another panel on what is the state of the legal industry from boardrooms to courts to firms? That panel will feature Sean Fagan, Chief Legal Officer of Citadel, Gary Feinerman, partner at Latham and Watkins and former federal district judge on the Northern District of Illinois and state solicitor general, uh, Daryl Josipher, Executive VP and Chief Counsel of the U.S. Chamber Litigation Center, and the Honorable John uh, Oh, pardon me if I butcher this, Nalbandian, uh, judge of the United States Court of Appeals, Sixth Circuit. And on Friday, May 19th, we are proud to host the second annual in-house counsel network conference at the Union League Club of Chicago, which will feature the Honorable Michael McKaysey, the former Attorney General of the United States, uh, Paul Clement, partner at Clement and Murphy PLLC and former Solicitor General of the United States, uh, the Honorable Hester Pierce, Commissioner of the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, and the Honorable Eugene Scalia, partner at Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher, and the former United States Secretary of Labor, uh, among other great speakers. Uh, so please do join us uh, for one or both of those events. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our host and this evening's moderator, Patrick Doherty. Uh, Mr. Doherty is a senior corporate and securities law partner at Foley and Lardner LLP based in Chicago. He is also an adjunct professor of Cornell Law School where he teaches in residence each fall term. He is a member of the bar in New York, the District of Columbia, North Carolina, Michigan and Illinois. Credentialing organizations have named him Lawyer of the Year in both Michigan in 2007 and Illinois in 2022. A graduate of Northwestern University and of Cornell Law School, class of 1981, he clerked for the Southern District of New York Chief Judge Lloyd McMahon for a year before entering into private practice. Mr. Doherty has also, also served as counsel to the SEC Commissioner Edward Fleischman in Washington, D.C. from 1986 through 89. An emeritus member of the American Law Institute, he is the author, co-author, or editor of several books and many articles on securities regulation and new financial products. Pat believes that he was the first lawyer inside the SEC to join the Federalist Society when he became a member in the late 1980s. A mainstay of the Chicago Lawyers Chapter uh, at the national level of the society, he serves on the Executive Committee for Financial Services and E-Commerce Practice Group. And with that, I'd like to turn the program over to Pat. Thank you, David, for your very kind introduction. Uh, I, I will begin with a chronology of recent events uh, extracted and edited from the pages of the Wall Street Journal, uh, and will then introduce this illustrious panel uh, whose members will share their current thinking about digital asset law and policy. Uh, <clears throat> In November 2021, uh, immediately after our last program, we've done this three times now, 
The price of Bitcoin peaked at just under 68,000 US dollars. I use Bitcoin as sort of a barometer for the health of the digital assets industry. In February 22, you may remember this if you watch TV, I don't. FTX and other crypto companies ran Super Bowl ads. Bitcoin was trading at about mm, $42,000 and change. On May 4, the Fed raised its benchmark rate by 50 basis points to tame soaring inflation, sparking a sell-off in long-duration assets, including, it seems, Bitcoin. On May 9th, Terra, an algorithmic stablecoin, lost its peg to the U.S. dollar, triggering a sell-off of Terra. Along with its sister coin, Luna, Terra lost $40 billion in value. On June 12th, crypto lender Celsius told users it was freezing all account withdrawals, citing extreme market conditions. On June 27th, hedge fund Three Arrows Capital, which had invested heavily in Terra, defaulted on loan payments to Voyager. 3AC was heavily levered. Its other lenders included Genesis and BlockFi. Two days later, a British Virgin Islands bankruptcy court ordered 3AC to liquidate. One week later, Voyager filed for bankruptcy when it faced a run on its assets. Then things were relatively peaceful until November. A horrible month, November. On November 2nd, um, Coindesk reported that a big piece of Alameda's assets was a token created by FTX, which the firm might have overvalued. This triggered a run on FTX. Six days later, FTX agreed to be taken over by its rival, Binance. The very next day, Binance walked away from a deal to rescue FTX, saying the issues it found there in due diligence could not be repaired. And the day after that, the Wall Street Journal reported that FTX had loaned several billion dollars in customer assets, in customer assets, to its sister company, Alameda. The day after that, November 11th, a very important day, uh, FTX filed for bankruptcy. Two weeks later, crypto lender BlockFi filed for bankruptcy. In December, uh, Sam Bankman-Fried was arrested in the Bahamas after prosecutors in New York filed criminal charges against him. He, he agreed to extradition in short order and was transferred into U.S. custody. On December 22nd, Sam was released on $250 million bond in order to stay in his parents' home in Palo Alto. On January 12th, 12th we're now getting into this year, <laughs> the SEC sued Genesis and Gemini over their lending products. One, le one week later, Genesis filed for bankruptcy. In February, the SEC proposed a new asset custody rule that would make it harder for many fund managers to invest customer money in crypto assets. February 16th, the SEC charged Do Kwan, founder of Terra and Luna, with securities fraud, but Do Kwan was, uh, could not be found anywhere. <clears throat> February 23rd, the federal prosecutors unveiled a new indictment against Sam, charging him with bank fraud. He had lied to Silvergate. <clears throat> On uh, March 1, uh, Silvergate said that a bank run, we could talk for hours about that. I represent Silvergate. Um, a bank run had put it at risk of being less than well capitalized and that it was evaluating the effect of those events on its ability to continue as a going concern. Well, whenever a company says it's not sure it could be a going concern, that company is no longer going to be a going concern. And so uh, within a week, uh, Silvergate said that um, it would be shutting down its business, and it did. 
I'm going to skip a couple of events. I mean, and this is a parade of horribles, but uh, in March, March 22, Coinbase announced that it had been served with an SEC Wells notice. March 23rd, um, Do Kwan was found in Montenegro, so the D Justice Department charged him uh, with fraud. Uh, on March 27th, the CFTC sued Binance. And the next day, prosecutors brought a third indictment against Sam Bankman Fried charging him with conspiring to bribe Chinese government officials to regain access to about a billion dollars in crypto assets. That's the third indictment he's faced so far. April 9th, FTX CEO John Ray reported that the exchange's collapse resulted from, and I quote, hubris, incompetence, and greed, close quote, pointing to Sam and his senior management team who'd been living together in the Bahamas. Yesterday, uh, SEC Chair Gary Gensler uh, testified in Congress for the first time in 18 months. He spent the day dodging tough questions from the House majority, one of whom said to him sarcastically, and I quote, your obfuscation is amazing, congratulations, close quote. I stopped watching at that point, I was satisfied. Uh, let's now turn to our panel and hear their thoughts. I'm gonna introduce them in the order in which I plan to call on them. Um, Jerry Lozier um, is what the in crypto industry would call a TradFi banker. <laughs> he made a long career as a bank regulatory expert inside Wells Fargo and Comerica Bank, moving in later life to Winston Strawn here in Chicago. Jerry also worked for the Fed in Washington as a young lawyer. A perennial contributor to FedSoc, he has been following digital asset developments closely and comfortably from his well-deserved recent retirement on Chicago's North Shore. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Catherine Kirkpatrick Boss very recently became chief legal officer of CBOE Digital, like two days ago, that recently. Before accepting that role, she was general counsel of Maple Finance, and before that, she was a partner of King & Spaulding. Catherine is a graduate of USC and Notre Dame Law School, where she has a notable advisory role. Dan Davis, sitting next to Catherine, is basically, uh, is basically family to me, but that's not why Dan is here. Based in DC, he is co-chair of the financial markets practice of Catton, before that, he was general counsel of the CFTC, where he earned the Chairman's Award for Excellence. That's a very big deal. And before that, he worked in practice with Eugene Scalia, which is also a very big deal, uh, where their team made a practice of defending American business from an overreaching administrative state. Uh, that's my interpretation of it. Um, good interpretation. Pat. Thanks. Scholarly Dan was an executive editor of the University of Chicago Law Review. Welcome back to Chicago, Dan Davis. John Olden McGinnis, seated next to Jerry Lozier, is the George C. Dix professor at Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law. Several uh, of uh, his uh, Northwestern students are here with us tonight. Like Dan, he is joining us for the, for the third time tonight. Trained at Harvard and Oxford, John, has an earned reputation in the academy and in FedSoc as one of the best constitutional law scholars, period, full stop. John is perhaps the leading exponent of originalism, which requires one to look backward in time. But he looks forward as well. That's how he became interested in digital assets. John saw potential in Bitcoin. His reading and his active mind led him to write scholarly articles and to teach a seminar on blockchain, crypto, and smart contracts that is fully subscribed by Northwestern students. Welcome back, Professor. Alex Hughes, seated next to John, has joined us tonight from Houston, where he is the chief legal officer of Sand Clock. Alex was a field artillery officer in the U.S. Army, a patriot, thank you. And I say thank you for that, Alex. He matriculated at the University of Texas Law School and trained in several blue-chip law firms before going into business. 
I see in your bio that you are an assistant to Professor Henry Hugh at Texas. Much respect for that. Thank you for joining us tonight, Alex. Last but not least, Dane Lund in the center is a graduate of Yale College and Harvard Law School who trained as a Wall Street lawyer in New York before transitioning into investment banking for private equity and then moving on to crypto. Today, Dane is a DAO architect for the Web3 accelerated, accelerator known as DeFi Alliance. You might think of DeFi Alliance as uh, the Y Combinator of the crypto economy, taking states and numerous startups, some of which have been quite successful. Pro bono publico, Dane is currently trying to talk the Illinois legislature into amending ill-conceived legislation that would drive much crypto business out of this state and perhaps out of the United States. So there's the lineup. Let's dig in. Jerry Lozier, yes. we'll start with you. The crypto industry paid scant attention to banking regulation until recently. We've never covered it in our seminar. When, when 2023 began, there were three go-to lenders for crypto businesses. They were Silvergate Bank, Silicon Valley Bank, and Signature Bank. Then, in less than one month, there were none. They were all gone. What do you make of this? <laughs> well, actually, I was going to, uh, Pat, talk about two things. One, the, uh, what would have happened had bank regulation applied to FTX? Um, and that's not just a fantasy. Uh, the president has a crypto working group, uh, as you know. This will be very useful. Thank and, you. Yeah, and, the, and the rumors are that it's leaning toward recommending that uh, crypto firms be subject to bank regulation. So I thought it would be fun to walk through what, how bank regulation would have applied to FTX had, had it been subject to bank regulation. And then I will turn to the recent developments that, um, bank, from the bank regulators that obviously are going to indirectly please, affect the... Please, please have at it. Okay. Okay. Um, as Pat mentioned, I'm a bank regulatory lawyer by background, and so I, when I read the news accounts of what happened at FTX, I was absolutely shocked. Uh, and while in the final analysis, what happened there might just be simple garden variety common law fraud, uh, it could never have transpired had FTX been regulated like a bank is regulated. So we thought it might be interesting to walk through the FTX facts as reported in the, in the media and uh, bank, pertinent bank regulations and see how they would have applied. Um, as anyone familiar with the words Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank knows, uh, bank regulation is not perfect. But I think it would have protected the customers of FTX uh, had it, uh, FTX been subject to them. Okay, the pertinent facts as reported. Number one, the financial statements of FTX and other crypto firms generally are not audited uh, according to GAAP. Number two, those financial statements generally are not publicly available, not available to their customers. Number three, FTX allegedly, as Pat mentioned, lent billions of dollars customer funds to an affiliate, Alameda Research. Uh, number four, FTX misused customer assets in other ways, such as using them for uh, political contributions, personal expenses, such as purchase of luxury real estate, donations to nonprofits to curry favor with the public, bribes of Chinese officials, uh, number five, FTX had a board of directors, but it never met. Uh, <laughs> seriously. Uh, number, uh, number six, FTX, if it had any risk management at all, it was poor risk management. Uh, number seven, FTX obviously operated in the U.S., but also was based in the Bahamas, so it's an international company. Um, but there was no uh, international regulator with responsible with responsibility for looking at the holistic, consolidated firm and to share information with um other host state regulators. Uh, number eight, crypto firms such as FTX are infamous uh, and no, uh, notorious uh, for being sources of money laundering. Um, and finally, um, in February, a bankruptcy judge presiding over the Celsius Network bankruptcy ruled, based on Celsius's contractual terms of use that were accepted by its customers by a simple click of a button, that the digital assets that the customers deposited with uh, Celsius constituted assets of the bankruptcy estate, so the customers were just unsecured creditors of that bankruptcy estate, and that could serve as precedent for the FTX bankruptcy and, and the BlockFi bankruptcy as well. So now let me walk through 
pertinent bank, and I'm going to mention one broker-dealer regulation. Number one, banks are required by law to have annual audits of their financial statements in accordance with GAAP. Number two, those financial statements are available to the public and the, their customers, uh, at the very least on the FDIC's website, but often just at the bank itself. Number three, banks are prohibited from lending to their affiliates other than on arm's length basis subject to market terms and conditions. Those, any and such loan ha is limited to 10% of the bank's capital in the case of any single affiliate, and all loans to all affiliates are capped at 20% of the bank's capital, and each loan has to be secured at least 100% to 130% based on the nature of the collateral. Um, number four, after the Bernie Madoff scandal, the SEC adopted a rule requiring broker-dealers to place customer assets into the possession of an independent custodian. Uh, number five, banks are regularly examined by regulatory agency examiners who review the minutes of the board and board uh, committee meetings, among other things, meet with the board of directors, and of course, under general corporate law, and especially in the eyes of bank regulators, the board of directors is legally responsible for the affairs of the bank. So the examiners meet regularly with those boards to ensure that the boards are fulfilling those duties. Uh, the directors are subject to removal by the regulators. They're subject to civil money penalties of up to a million, more than a million dollars a day um, if there's a violation of law that harms the bank or other conduct that harms the bank. And if the bank fails, they're subject to potential personal liability for the bank's law, FDIC's losses, actually. Um, six, banks are required to have comprehensive risk management processes and controls, including a chief risk officer. Number seven, banks with international operations are subject to a framework of regulation led by the home country regulator who cooperates with the host state regulators to ensure a holistic uh, approach to regulation of the organization so nothing can be done at one end that the other uh, regulators aren't aware of. Number eight, banks are required to have robust anti-money laundering uh, controls. They are examined specifically every year, uh, an AML exam, and any bank that knowingly launders money can have its charter revoked or its FDIC insurance terminated. Um, Almost finally, banks are subject to comprehensive risk-based capital requirements based on the nature of the assets held, and that capital is a cushion from which creditors can be repaid if the bank fails. And, of course, uh, deposits of bank customers are insured by the FDIC, and banks pay premiums for that insurance. So let's see what happens if you apply those uh, rules and regulations to FTX. And the, the answer is very obvious. Number one, FTX would have had to have it, had audited financial statements. And those financial statements would have been available to the customers. So the customers could have assessed uh, the risk of turning funds over to uh, FTX. Uh, number three, FTX could not have lent more than 10% of its capital to Alameda Research. And then it could have only done so on a fully secured basis. Uh, number four, and this is that broker-dealer regulation, its customer assets would have been, uh, had to be deposited with an independent custodian, and so they couldn't have been used for political contributions, personal expenditures, donations to nonprofits, or the payment of bribes. And number five, its board of directors would have been required to meet regularly and to attend to the affairs of the company, or they would have, the directors would have been removed or fined. It would, FTX would have had to have uh, robust risk management uh, processes in place to prevent what occurred. There would have been a regulator. Uh, responsible for the holistic consolidated supervision of FTX. There would have been a capital cushion against which creditor claims could have been repaid, and FDIC insurance or some similar type of insurance fund would be available to pay up to $250,000 to cover a customer loss. Now, I'm not suggesting that crypto should be regulated in the same manner as banks are, but that model has served banks and their customers fairly well, and I think it would have protected FTX and its customers of FTX and uh the others. Let me turn to recent bank regulatory developments because they're really important for uh, the, the crypto. I wanted to say the poor crypto industry. Um, on January 3rd, the bank regulators jointly issued a statement uh, on crypto asset risks to banking organizations. And they listed eight risks. I don't have time to go through the eight. They also um, very implicitly but not directly um, imposed certain prohibitions and certain duties on banks related to how they handle uh, crypto assets. Those warnings from the bank regulars can 
could easily reduce crypto firms' access to the U.S. banking system, a la Operation Chokepoint, which has been mentioned. And for those who don't know Operation Chokepoint, that was a now discredited program conducted by the Obama administration using the FDIC to choke off politi politically disfavored businesses such as payday lenders, gun dealers, by discouraging banks from serving those firms as customers, and even discouraging banks from serving contractors to those firms. Um, banks, bankers, now you've got to put yourself in the shoes of a banker. These guys are profit seekers, and if you're going to impose the costs of special risk management, board oversight, policies, procedures, guardrails, monitoring on banking a particular industry, such as, such as crypto, and you're going to inc impose that expense on banking crypto, a lot of bankers are going to say, whoa, that's going to hurt our profit margins. We can't do it. Um, on January 27th, the Fed, in a policy statement, clarified that banks would need a non-objection letter from the Fed if they were going to issue stable coins or dollar tokens. On February 23rd, the bank regulators issued another joint statement warning banks to be mindful of liquidity risks related to cryptocurrencies. They're worried about runs. Um, and um, on March 19th, the biggest thing of all, the FDIC announced that Flagstar Bank would assume all the deposits of failed signature bank, pause for it, except for $4 billion in deposits of crypto companies. Now, the Wall Street Journal and Barney Frank, who's father of the Dodd-Frank Act, used to be chairman of the House Financial Services Committee and is on the board of Signature Bank, expressed suspicions that the bank was seized because the FDIC was hostile to crypto. But the significance of that was that the crypto depositors at Signature Bank don't have a bank. They've got to find another bank because Flagstar is not assuming those deposits. Um, and that may not be easy in light of all of these warnings from the bank regulators. Reportedly, crypto firms are looking for bank accounts offshore, Puerto Rico, Bermuda, the Bahamas. Yesterday, there was an article about Hong Kong. But the bottom line of all of these bank regulatory developments is that bankers will take them as a distinct signal to avoid banking crypto firms. And without access to banking services, it's very difficult for a firm to do business. You can't pay your, it's hard to pay workers, hard to pay your vendors if you don't have bank accounts. Um, and so, uh, the, the outlook, at least from a bank regulatory perspective, the outlook for the crypto industry may not be as healthy as we wished it would be. Pat, Jer that's <clears throat> Jerry, that's a tour de force. Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Is Operation Choke Point legal? I mean, can the, can the Fed and the Treasury do this? Well, I mean, the short answer is they were caught and, hum and humiliated and there were congressional hearings into it, and so they had to back off. But what it, the way it works... Yeah, to tell you more you want to know, banks are examined by examiners yeah. who uh, are in there every year looking at every book and record, everything you do to make sure it's complying with law and safe and sound. And these examiners have enormous, sub yeah. uh, enormously subjective discretion to criticize anything they want. And if they criticize you because you're, you're banking payday loan lenders, you're le uh, you know, that money could, could, could leave the bank tomorrow because it's from an industry that is... Um, unstable, you know, we're not saying don't bank payday lenders, but, you know, it might be better if you didn't. And that's that's the way it works, I'm afraid. That's the way the bank examiners work, and they get a signal from Washington, and that's that's the way Operation Choke Point worked. But, again, it was discredited, and uh, Department of Justice supposedly had a hand in it, um, Eric Holder and that group. Um, and Elizabeth and, Warren. And Elizabeth Warren, absolutely. She's so. still political. She's raising an army to fight crypto. So, um, wow. Um, very sobering. Thank you. Um, we might have to cover banking again. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn to Catherine, seated uh, to my left here, who uh, and ask, and I'll give you the microphone if you'd like it. Uh-huh. Uh, ask you to comment on you know what the SEC has been doing uh, uh, because they they have they've had certainly had a big role. They've been doing a lot. They've been they've been very active lately, and they've been hiring a lot as well. Uh, yeah, you know I I think that Jerry's comments were interesting because crypto exists in part to help the underbanked, and now crypto itself is underbanked. 
And I'll also comment that your overview, Pat, gave me a little bit of PTSD as a DeFi general counsel in 2022. I actually went in-house as a DeFi GC in January of 2022. So what a ride. Uh, but, you know, I think a lot of fellow crypto GCs share my opinion that this year, although extremely difficult, is part of the maturation of a nascent industry. So it's also going to weed out a lot of the projects and protocols that never should have existed in the first place. Uh, you know, no one in crypto wants to see an FTX, which I firmly believe is just fraud and, you know, driven by a sociopath wrapped up in crypto. No one wants to see that. It really damaged the industry. And it, it still upsets me to think about that and to think about all of the retail investors who lost money. Um, and there was very little discussion of that in the press. So moving on to the SEC, I have said my piece. Take a deep breath, move on. Uh, you know, I think the interesting part about the SEC is obviously crypto and Chair Gensler are, you know, I would say the posture is almost warlike at this point. And that actually makes me sad. Uh, my private practice background for many years at King & Spalding was actually a white collar defense and government investigation. So I had extensive dealings with the SEC, SEC enforcement, DOJ, other regulators. And in my experience, I think the honey over vinegar approach to advocacy is more productive. So I worry a little bit about where we are. Now, you know, we could point fingers all day long. The SEC has a perspective, crypto has a perspective, but the US environment for, you know, the SEC and crypto is, is not good right now. And I, I firmly hope that that actually improves. Uh, the real issue here, I thought I would take a moment just to educate people as to why it is very difficult right now for SEC entity or crypto entities to come in and register using the words of Chair Gensler. Uh, you know, I think that's been really discussed at great length because there's a lot of confusion about the registration process for one. I don't think a lot of people, including people in traditional financial services, who aren't lawyers understand the cost and the time involved in registration, even if you aren't a crypto project. And then there are a couple just distinct realities about registration that crypto can't overcome right now. For one, it's not technically possible for a lot of crypto to register because the nature of the tech involved in crypto makes it impossible to abide by certain rules. I'm not gonna go in the weeds about this. I'll leave it there, but I can tell you, anyone in crypto could talk your ear off about that. We could have a whole conference about the limitations, or I shouldn't say limitations, the uniqueness of the tech that makes it difficult. And that is a lot of the core argument as to why the current securities laws, you know, who were drafted by a majority of the drafters were alive during Custer's last stand. I'll just point that out why those laws are not appropriate for this new technology and innovation. Two, intermediaries, 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 intermediaries. Everything about the current state of regulation involves more and more intermediaries. You know, we're talking broker dealers, we're talking custody, we're talking AML, et cetera, et cetera. And crypto and DeFi exists to eliminate some of those intermediaries. Not so we can go around the rules. You know, I mean, I'm a goody two shoes. It's one of the reasons I became a lawyer. I want to follow the rules, but it's to create efficiencies. So to have to turn around and go backward and, and you know, basically obtain the use of intermediaries just for the sake of a rule, uh, that's very difficult for crypto to swallow. Now, some of those intermediaries are important, as we just saw from Jerry's overview. Like, we, we need auditors, okay? But some of those can be replaced by tech and arguably improve the safety in addition to the efficiencies. So it's very difficult to go backward and have to use those intermediaries. Three, there's a lot of little things. I'll just point out one to leave you with. Good example, section 11 of the 33 Act is a strict liability provision. When you're talking about a blockchain oriented protocol, you could argue that effectively that could create strict product liability. 
So you're saying all of a sudden all those, you know, provisions that exist where if this goes wrong, you know, the, the individual founder or director or officer is not going to be held liable. That's not the case, arguably, with a protocol. That's a huge, huge barrier to entry. And one of the things I love about crypto is the brilliance that I see in crypto. You know, I left my law firm, spent my years at a large law firm surrounded by brilliant people, but I went into an industry surrounded by people that I felt, you know, consistently stupider than. And I love that feeling, you know, scary smart. And we're talking lawyers and we're also talking engineers. And the key that I hear a lot about Web3 is, you know, Web3, the ideas are conceived by technology, by engineers, and brought to life by MBAs. Whereas Web 2, it's, it's flipped. You know, an MBA has an idea and uses technology to bring it to life. So we need the existence of Web 3. There's some beauty there. Another thing I'll notice is just the practical aspect of things like insurance. You know, there's no insurer that, I mean, you can get insurance in crypto. You know, I, I uh, walked the very long path of getting DNO insurance for Maple as general counsel. But it is very difficult and I believe unprecedented to date to see, you know, a, obviously unprecedented because it doesn't exist, a registered crypto entity that's fully insured. You have a gap in insurance. You have an even bigger gap in reinsurance. So just practically, how are you going to bring all of this to life? So I want to pause there and just leave that for everyone's consideration and say you have a fundamental point where to bring crypto to a fully scaled asset class, the one gap in my mind is uh, we're lacking a clear set of regulations, right? It's a barrier to institutional entry. It's a barrier to retail, you know, kind of embracing this on a widespread basis. But we need those clear set of regulations. And what are we going to see in the next three to five years? I don't know. We're not going to get any good legislation in the next couple of years, maybe a stable coin bill. That's my prediction. So we're going to see more enforcement activity. But as everyone, particularly this audience, recognizes and understands, enforcement activity is not law. And, you know, we have kind of a point where the SEC has taken the view that all of these crypto projects should register or shutter because they should take advice and see the writing on the wall through enforcement activity. But a lot of the crypto community is saying, well, enforcement activity is not law. And, you know, I can tell you that there are a lot of really smart, really highly ethical lawyers in the space that say, I'm taking an objective view of the law and of the precedent as it applies to my project, my protocol, as it applies to crypto. I have a leg to stand on. Now, what are we going to see? I hope we see more litigation because we'll see more precedent. And, you know, I trust the judges to implement some barriers that are non-existent as of now. Um, I would take litigation and precedent. Uh, I mean, I would love some law, but I would take precedent. And I hope that comes sooner than later, because otherwise we have an increasingly, uh, you know, unwieldy SEC perspective. I would like to find a path forward to work proactively and collaboratively with the regulators, including the SEC right now. I'm not giving up on that. I, you know, think that there's a lot of smart people and ethical people at the SEC who genuinely want to forward and advance investor protection, but we, we need to get there and, and I'm not quite sure how we're gonna get there. So let me pause, Pat. And it's, it's very thoughtful. I, the, uh, <clears throat> doesn't the industry need to win a case somewhere to really get some traction here? I mean, <clears throat> one disadvantage is that the SEC has nationwide jurisdiction and venue. So <clears throat> for some reason, they never seem to bring cases in the Fifth Circuit. I wonder <laughs> Actually, I think I know what it is. But, you know, they bring them in friendly jurisdictions where they're more likely to get a judge to so, so maybe Ripple wins or somebody wins. And because there's only three, four adverse precedents, but they've gone to the SEC so far. Yeah, and the SEC has been... And, and, and 100 other settlements are not law, but they will treat it as if it were law. They cite their own settlements yeah. as if they were binding precedent. Who's that? 
The SEC has been very smart and strategic with their litigation strategy to date. So, yes, crypto needs a win. And, you know, one comment I'll make on your point of nationwide jurisdiction, there's also this question of extraterritoriality and jurisdiction. You know, crypto is borderless. So you hear a lot of crypto projects saying, I'm going to go overseas. I'm just going to pick up and go overseas. You know, Brian Armstrong said that just the other day, that he wasn't ruling out the possibility of going overseas. That frustrates me a little bit. As someone who represented a lot of, you know, foreign entities in U.S. government investigations, it's very difficult to just abscond and, and you know, <laughs> get away from Team America World Police. There are a lot of jurisdictional hooks that the regulators can still use. So that's not a solution for crypto. And I, I, I hope I see more productive discussion that just doesn't involve picking up and making all of your employees move to Cayman. I mean, as nice as Cayman is. Well, it's, 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 it's you'd, have to, you'd have to avoid U.S. customers, I think. Exactly. That's the key thing. And you don't really want to avoid U.S. customers because it's the biggest market in the world, the richest market in the world. And we could talk about geo-blocking and the use of VPN and what about the founders who are talking on U.S. podcasts, et cetera. So there's a, there's a blurred line there. Thank you for your thoughts. I'm going to ask Dan, um, Dan Davis, uh, who has thoughts about the SEC as well. But uh, I'm going to say your official topic, Dan, is the CFTC and the CEA. And But, you know, you're a smart guy. Uh, if you've got thoughts about uh, SEC or other matters, uh, uh, you know, feel free to feel free to weigh in there, too. But why don't you start by telling us what you see going on under the Commodity Exchange Act and the CFTC and well, Pat, you know I can't help bringing the SEC into something. Whoa. So, um, well, they, you know, <laughs> let me share an anecdote. So, um, you know, Pat mentioned um, the the one of the many rule proposed rules the SEC has brought forth is the the investment advisor custody rule, uh, and actually that is one of the the few places where you see an actual clear statement from the commission, not from not from a chairman, not from a commissioner, but you have the clearest statement I've seen yet about the, the SEC's view uh, about crypto uh, and uh, the securities laws. And, and the statement goes something like this. They view the, the majority or the large majority of crypto asset securities, which is their term that I've never heard before, uh, are, are securities. Uh, and I remember reading that. It's, on, uh, it's a, with footnote 29 uh, of that release. And, and I was bothered that because I know, as I've previously sued the SEC, they have to look at the economic impacts of their proposals. And the relevant economic analysis is not how many crypto are securities. What matters is how much of the market capitalization of crypto are securities. And so I started looking into that question, and I got a lot of good help from my old uh, uh, commission, the CFTC. And if you take the top 12 digital assets by market capitalization, that covers about 86% of the market. Well, what have the commissions respectively said about those top 12 um, digital assets? The CFTC, in enforcement actions, so things that have been approved by the commission as a whole, have asserted that number one, two, three, five, and 12 are all commodities, meaning they're not securities. The top two of those, Ether and Bitcoin, which comprise, depending on the day, about 60% of the market, have been trading on CFTC-regulated exchanges for over five years now. And the SEC has never formally challenged any of those contracts. And so if you take, if you take the five, those top five that the CFTC has asserted are commodities, that's 75% of the market. Um, that a fellow regulator has said are not securities. Well, certainly the SEC, you know, with all of the, the chairman's statements, of course, they probably made similar claims. Well, let's look at what they said. Of those top 12, the SEC has asserted that one, number six, XRP, is a security, which is still in litigation, as we know. Uh, XRP is 2% of the market. Um, the, S the CFTC, when they brought their claim against Binance, you can have all sorts of arguments about the, you know, the, the underlying strength of that allegation. But in that complaint, the SEC, the CFTC 
argued, you know, once again, reference Bitcoin and Ether and Litecoin and Tether and USDC, all major um, digital assets were the bases for the CFTC complaint. And the argument is that, um, you know, Binance was trading swaps, uh, that swaps is CFTC jurisdiction and, and Binance.com was trading with U.S. persons. Fine. Well, the SEC recently brought a complaint against Bittrex. Uh, and uh, they referenced several currencies, but they, they focused on six. They said these six digital assets are the ones that we think makes Bittrex a national security exchange. They should have been a dealer. They should have registered as a clearing agency. Bittrex trades well over 100 coins. I didn't match them all up, but it's most of the top coins in market capitalization. They didn't go after the top 10. They didn't go after the top 20 or the top 30. You have to get to number 40 before the SEC alleges that one of them was a security. And they also allege that number 77, 164, number 1,186, number 2,092, and number 2,999 as terms of, in terms of market capitalization were securities. And Bittrex has asserted in a public statement that the SEC never told them which of the digital assets they were trading were securities. So if I'm, if I'm you know, a general counsel and the SEC tells me that 2%, it amounts to about 1.5% to 2% of, of the total market capitalization on my exchange are securities, well, one thing I might decide to do is maybe I won't trade those uh, particular ones. That's very different than facing you know, an injunction for having to be a national securities exchange. So I think there is given commission action, I think there is some clarity developing on the larger digital assets about where the jurisdiction lies. Because the SEC, for all of their talk, hasn't challenged the CFTC on, on, on any of these assertions. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. And so I, I, I hope that this type of activity, I agree it would be great if we get a formal court decision in one of these cases. But I think you can look to the CFTC activity for some sort of counterweight to the SEC about the way in which there are other regulators saying that, you know, the SEC's uh, sales are not as broad as they say they are. That's all very well said, Dan. I, <clears throat> we are in Chicago where the Merck trades futures on Bitcoin and futures on Ether, which it could not do without SEC permission, if Bitcoin or Ether. And the SEC had an opportunity in both cases to raise its hand and say, we'd like to have a say in this. That's the way the protocol works. They didn't do it. So I say they're foreclosed on that. Yesterday, in yesterday's hearing, Chair Gensler was asked at least five times. I stopped counting after five. At least five times, is Ether a security or not? And he dodged the question every time. Every time. He dodged the question. He just said, well... Uh, in order to be, a, uh, to be a security, there's an analysis that we go through. Da, da, da. Stop, sir. I'm going to ask you again. Yes or no? Is it a security? He just refused to answer at least five times. So here's a question you can ask at Federalist Society again. Does he honor the rule of law when he behaves that way? I mean, deliberately keeping uh, 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 critical facts like that shrouded from public view. Um, this is just um, uh, in a terror policy, is it not? I mean, I'm telling you, most of the assets are securities, but I won't tell you which one. Uh, you know, uh, it's windy in Chicago on most days, on most days. But that doesn't mean it's windy today. You know, why don't you tell me this asset, security, excuse me, or not? Any thoughts about that? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I'll look at the, at the um, you know, the proposed uh, redefinition of exchange that came out on yeah, Friday. Yeah, Friday. Um, and, and I was reminded of a famous quote from, from, you know, the late Justice Scalia. You know, this wolf comes as a wolf. Um, that, was a, that, was an, that was a definition that was originally proposed. I mean, Pat and I, you and I discussed yeah. this. Uh, we, we didn't know whether the SEC was talking about crypto in that release. Uh, and, you know, several people helped put in comment letters saying you need to explain this. Okay. 
700 pages didn't use the words crypto or digital assets once, not once. But they took the position that it applied to the digital asset industry. <laughs> and, and so they come out on Friday and said, yes, actually it does, and it's very difficult for you to comply. And if you exit the, yeah. if you exit stage left, then, you know, you exit stage left. Well, the theory is they're reopening the comment period in anticipation of litigation. And it's actually very mm -hmm. smart because there's an oversight in the you know, new definition that doesn't name crypto, doesn't make it clear that it applies to DeFi. They realized the oversight in large part because there was a slew of comments and obviously a massive outcry on that point, in addition to all the other legitimate points like free speech considerations and FTC overlap and jurisdiction, et cetera. We could have a whole panel on that role. But now they reopen the comment period so they can make it clear and anticipate that you know, cause in litigation. Catherine, uh, uh, the SEC refers to DeFi as the so-called quote-unquote DeFi industry, yeah. using scare quotes, yeah. you know, the so-called DeFi industry. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, dripping with sarcasm. <laughs> uh, dripping. A lot of good in DeFi. Not yeah. all, it's not all bad, as yeah. as I'm sure Ian will weigh in on as well. We're getting some feedback here. Mm -hmm. Am I doing Let's turn that one off. Yeah. yeah. Is there that we go. better? Did that help? Yep. Yeah. No, it didn't. Hmm. Did I do this? I'll take it over there. Anyway, uh, uh, Professor McGinnis. Um, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> I, I, I really, I mean, you. Yeah, this you, was off. Uh, well, th well, thank you. Uh, uh, so yeah, I yeah. always learn a lot at these uh, conferences or people who actually uh, work uh, in this space. As an academic, uh, as a professor, I'll do what professors do, talk much more generally about the future of crypto uh, and describe it as uh, maybe propelled by the solutions or the uh, fault lines of two paradoxes. So let me just go back to the idea that of crypto as a political project. I think there's no doubt it was a libertarian project, and it's useful to remind us of that. Of course, the federal we began by discussing the federal size of a group of conservative and libertarian lawyers, uh, and crypto is, is clearly a libertarian project. Uh, uh, Satoshi, Nakamoto, whoever he, she, or they are, uh, began uh, after the banking crisis of 2008. And I think you can see Bitcoin as an effort to replace two kinds of intermediaries. One, the intermediary of the Fed uh, with respect to dollars. Uh, and then also the intermediary of the banking system, which had failed. And in some sense, uh, both uh, private intermediaries and public intermediaries like the Fed share a real problem of agency costs, uh, sort of obvious with financial intermediaries, we've just been discussing, <laughs> and, and Pat has described uh, some of those uh, agency costs and the events that uh, derive from them. But that's also true of the Federal Reserve, right? The Federal Reserve, we want our money to be a stable source of value. The Federal Reserve has other objectives. Moreover, uh, we don't really control the Fed. Politics uh, controls the Fed. And so that's the uh, essence, I think, of the uh, beginning of crypto is, is actually a political project. So where is that likely to go? I think there are two paradoxes of crypto. The first is that uh, even when, with respect to Bitcoin, which, as is point, pointed out, I think the SEC is even 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 Gensler has said is not a um, uh, uh, a security. Nevertheless, and therefore is uh, this decentralized structure that doesn't really depend on agents. Even Bitcoin. I think to succeed, at least at the moment, needs to use a variety of financial intermediaries. Simply, one, most people can't figure out how to hold Bitcoin. There are these very sad stories of people losing their Bitcoin keys and looking for it in some garbage dump. They've lost $3 million. 
And so they need some, most of them need some kind of wallet uh, uh, to make, uh, uh, to stabilize the value of Bitcoin, to make it a thicker market. They need forward and future markets. They need, uh, I think, uh, ultimately to have um, ETFs of Bitcoin. And all of these are kind of classic uh, financial intermediaries that I think under some structure perhaps should be regulated. Now, maybe not according to every jot and tittle of the current laws that don't that, that, that really are, are not uh, established for the kind of regulation, but at least they have some of the same peculiar problems of financial intermediaries and dangers of fraud that we have seen. So is there anything to be done about that? Uh, because that suggests that even Bitcoin is intertwined with uh, the traditional established financial intermediaries. Now, perhaps in the future, there is something to be done by that. Uh, there is something called uh, decentralized autonomous organizations that are set up simply by uh, contracts, uh, smart contracts and consensus, and that over time actually don't have any managers. So they're, uh, this is actually uh, taking the idea of of a Bitcoin and making a financial institution wholly decentralized and consensus based without uh, uh, managers. Now, to set that up, no one's going to set that up for free. There are some founders, and at least at the beginning, even those organizations are likely to have some agents. But at some point, it may not there, whatever, however they set it up and the, the coins they use to make the, um, it work and to give it value. Uh, they may not. They may be as, become as decentralized as a Bitcoin, and we might not think of it, particularly if they're all these transparent, smart contracts that everyone can follow, as like these uh, centralized organizations that require uh, regulation. So that would be a solution, I think, to this odd intertwining we have, even of something like Bitcoin, with the more established centralized intermediaries that give a purchase to regulation. And of course, once we allow regulation, we'll have the most centralized organization of all, the government coming in and doing things like Operation Checkpoint. And you might really worry about that, because ultimately, Bitcoin is a kind of competitor to the federal currency. And so they're not actually, we can't expect them to be an honest uh, broker. So maybe that that is a solu possible future solution as the cost of computation uh, 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 declines. The other paradox that I think we see in our future that may uh, be also intertwined with sort of centralized um, uh, crypto versus decentralized uh, crypto is the rise of CBDCs. So the idea of CBDC is a central bank digital currency. And now central banks are thinking, well, we can't beat Bitcoin. Let's join them. Of course, there's one huge difference between a central bank uh, currency is that it's not decentralized. It's just a digital form of the Fed. And some of there's thought to be some real advantages of why the Fed is looking at that. It really gets around money laundering, because it can follow all of your transactions. It gets around what is thought to be a problem for monetary policy, the zero interest rate abound, that the Fed cannot put its interest rate below zero because, of course, if it, banks are charging you to hold their money, you're going to put it in a mattress or at least in a vault. Uh, moreover, uh, it also allows for uh, the government to say, well, money can only be spent on certain things or maybe at certain times for fiscal uh, reasons or other reasons. So there are all these advantages. Well, of course, to describe those as advantages may at least to a uh, audience with some libertarian sympathies, they may not seem so advantageous. It seems that a central uh, uh, digital currency is a kind of benthamite pantopticon into everyone's uh, activities all the time. It's, so it's sort of the, the evil twin of, um, of crypto, uh, the origin of crypto. It be begins as a libertarian project, and it ends as a, well, well at least authoritarian, if not totalitarian uh, project. And so that's a worry. Now, you might say, though, that's not so bad for crypto, because precisely if they try to introduce CBDCs, everyone who's worried 
about these matters, there's going to be a great more uh, demand for things like Bitcoin <laughs> and because they want to avoid uh, having all their um, uh, transactions known easily by the government, by having uh, the government be able to uh, decide how whether they can get interest from it and decide uh, when and how it can be spent. So that's yet another paradox of crypto that actually I see perhaps playing out uh, in the future. And so I just end by saying uh, I think there are some very deep questions that are raised uh, by the uh, political nature of crypto. It's nature is a libertarian project, and these paradoxes, I think, will, and their solutions and their variations, are likely to, and are likely to have a big uh, say in whether uh, that libertarian ideal of Satoshi Nakamoto uh, succeeds. Thank you, uh, Professor. You've got a, a comment and, and a question as well, and a, and a follow-up. Uh, I identify as a libertarian. That's why I do this. But um, uh, how could we ever expect, really, um, the Fed, the Treasury, to help crypto assets when they are utterly opposed to one another? I mean, that's the, that's the, the centralized, centralized bank. I mean, Bitcoin was created because of distrust of the Fed and distrust of big banks and big government. Uh, and, 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 and if it succeeds, uh, then monetary policy is not within the control of the Fed, not exclusively anymore, right? If you're a central banker, you want to have exclusive control over the monetary policy uh, of the domain in which you work. So this is, that conflict of interest is like inevitable and should almost expect this to happen. The other thing I'll point, uh, I'll point out is that we're going to have a CBDC in the United States. In June, the Fed has announced that at a wholesale level, Fed now will roll out in June, and there are several banks that have been sort of like beta testers for it who are going to come online in June. So these are not individual accounts. You won't have an account directly with the Fed. Not that soon, but uh, at the wholesale level, it is being rolled. It was just announced last week or two weeks ago. Fed now is going to be real. So this is coming online. You know, it is coming online, and and, and if it frightens me because of all the, the issues you pointed out. If you know exactly what I own and you control it, you go to negative interest rates, and you you know you don't maybe you don't like that I belong to the Federalist Society, so you debit my account. Maybe you do. Uh, maybe you like that I'm uh, that I'm a socialist, so you credit my account. I mean, <laughs> uh, think about it. Um, well, can I just respond just briefly? Yeah, to that? yeah uh, so, please do. So one, is, so one, is, I, I do think there is a big difference between the retail and, and wholesale. Yes. The retail, I think, raises much greater worries about individual freedom. Uh, at least the Fed at the moment has said, I think it needs congressional authorization for mm -hmm. that. And I <laughs> think at least at the moment, people would raise questions like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's a great point. I mean, I think it's central that uh, there is this tension. So what the, at the moment, it would cost a lot of money for the Fed to destroy uh, Bitcoin. I don't know how much to make a 51 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, it would cost a lot of money. And the danger, I think, for the Fed is by the time it gets around to thinking that this could really be a replacement, there could be two problems for it. It would just be very costly to attack it. And then oh, there are all sorts of people who would own uh, Bitcoin. And so that might be the saving grace. But about the tension, the ultimate tension between them, I can't agree more. Well, foot voting. I mean, uh, capital goes to safer domains. Human beings go to safer domains. Uh, you know, it, foot voting. Uh, cap, so you'll see capital flight. And and by the way, Bitcoin is largely owned outside the United States even now. So, uh, you know, so maybe it's bought more in Latin America and in Asia. Proliferates. You know, Metcalfe's law. The network effects continue to kick in and it spreads. But. Venezuela and Turkey. But the opposition to it does seem natural to me, coming from centrists. I mean, 
<clears throat> New York bankers and Washington central bankers who would imagine they might be opposed to, <laughs> to decentralization. I mean, those are the, you know, the centralized banks are mainly located in New York and centralized government obviously is DC. So, um, Alex, uh, you work in DeFi. I think maybe you want to talk to us about that or, or not. Uh, uh, I, I, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you decide what you want to comment on. Do we have that? We fix that feedback. That's annoying. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but uh, did that work? Is it me? Did that work? Yeah, I think it was. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that, that, that would lead you to drink, by the way, so let's see that. See, there are technological fixes for everything. Um, so, well, thank you for coming here from Houston. Absolutely. I mean, thank you for that, having me. Uh, you know, that, that, you know, if you travel a great distance, you deserve three stars, right? So maybe this is a three star event. Well, hopefully, thank I you. can get two more. Oh, I was thinking on Uber ratings. <laughs> uh, so, basically, just at its base, DeFi or decentralized finance is kind of peer to peer finance. And it comes with its got three, I think, major both advantages and drawbacks. Those are transparency, efficiency, and censorship resistance. I think there's a big issue just in the general crypto space about thinking of regulation as a panacea. Regulation didn't stop toxic mortgage-based securities from infecting the entire global economy in the mid to late 2000s. Regulation didn't stop ratings agencies from rating those toxic securities as being AAA because they were rating to those regulations. Regulation didn't stop Lehman and Bear from collapsing. Regulation didn't stop Silvergate and SVP from collapsing. Anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing regulation didn't stop Deutsche Bank from moving money for the Iranian Revolutionary Guard for arms that were used against my unit in Iraq. So if we look at things like the FTX collapse, these again are failures of over-centralization and lack of transparency. Because everything that SBF was doing was taken off chain. If he was doing these things on chain, because the nature of the blockchain is it's a public, transparent, permanent, immutable ledger. You can see where money moves from point A to point B, easy as pie. Um, I can't remember his name, but the guy who used to be the head of the CIA who was commissioned by um, the, I can't remember the name of the company either, but it was doing a report on money laundering and crypto. And basically, one, traditional money laundering sources like untapped diamonds, cash, which is still king for every criminal activity, dwarf the amount of criminal activity done with crypto. And the other thing is, just from a surveillance perspective, when you can trace all these things on a public ledger from birth to death, you can much more easily engage in network analysis and figure out who's spending money to who than if you put things in these dark pools of money that banks are doing behind the scenes and you have no idea what's actually in their bundle of toxic assets. You have no idea where their money actually is. Whereas if you have these things on chain, you can go, you can look at my public ENS right now, DeFiAttorney.eth. You can see everything that's in there. See every stupid NFT I own, every monkey picture, whatever you want. But you can't go in ahead and see what Goldman Sachs has in their books right now. You couldn't go and see what SBF was actually doing at FTX with your money. And the real issue here is we need to leverage these benefits of this technology in a way that it performs what it's supposed to do and actually gives more consumer protection than we have from the SEC treating every single thing like a nail of securities regulation because that's the hammer it has. Yeah. And it's also just, it's frustrating being in the space. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes, but Calvin used to play this game called Calvin Ball where he'd just make up the rules as he goes. <laughs> and we've just been playing re regulatory Calvin Ball this whole time. And, um, Gary Gensler has been Calvin, and it's not been the funnest being on the receiving end of enforcement by re or regulation by enforcement. I think we're starting to see some pushback by federal judges, including in the library case, where 
the SEC is being taken to task for their equivocation and failure to give actual clear guidance. Um, my background before doing crypto is I actually used to do a lot of SCPA stuff, which again, nothing ever goes to court. Everything's this body of shadow precedent. And the SEC is like, this is what the law is because we say it's the law. And we're gonna, gonna go ahead and threaten you existentially or you can go ahead and pay us off. So it's basically just like racketeering. But it's okay racketeering because the government's doing it. But basically what I think we need to do is focus on investor education and transparency because if you can go ahead and know what is actually on everyone's books, you have a very clear idea of what the real risk is. And I also think with that sort of technology where you have real time full on transparency of what people are actually holding, you actually run into the risk of with periodic securities reporting, having misleading reports that are stale the moment they're signed off on by auditors. So I think what we need to do is stop trying to force the round peg of crypto into the square hole of SEC regulation. Um, I know I'm probably holding a monkey's paw when I kind of say that we probably need a purpose-built regulator, uh, but I just don't think it's also sensible to look at every single thing in the space as being a security and needing to be regulated as such. It's kind of like everything's on the internet right now, but Twitter's not the same as Uber, isn't the same as Instagram, isn't the same as ZocDoc, isn't the same as Grubhub. And there's a real danger that if we completely look at the industry through the lens of securities regulation, rather than just being a type of technology that may at times include securities, we stifle innovation, we force it offshore, and we accelerate the decline of the United States of America as the number one financial system in the world. Uh, it's so great, it's hard to disagree with that. You know, NFTs are not stable coins, are not ether, not Bitcoin. Not, there are many different kinds of crypto assets, and to keep them all is a scientific error, is it not? Yes. Uh, Well, um, Dane, we might have saved the best for last. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I'm either speaking last or I have the last word. So. Uh, in, in a lot of things, by the way, the, uh, the SEC has no love for DAOs. They have no love for DeFi. They say so-called DeFi. I just love that. How about so-called? Well, the latest pun by Chair Gensler was, you know, being a DeFi protocol is no excuse to DeFi the rules. <laughs> I, I enjoyed that one. I enjoyed that one. Um, but, it, you know, they treat DAOs that way, too. I mean, they basically, their view of DAOs is that there's really no such thing as decentralization. Everything is run by big dudes, and, and there must be intermediaries, and the intermediaries must be registered. So you can watch them. But this is the model we're used to. This is the way, but this is what we're used to. So it has to fit that model. Sure. You can talk about so, or, or, or tell us about what's going on in Illinois. So I'll, I'll start general, then I'll go specific. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, what, what, what makes me excited to speak here is that, you know, transparency in finance has, has actually cast a light on what's going on with government. And, and what I see is that there is a bad nexus between dogma and the executive branch. Uh, it's it's parlor, parlor room posh now. The Northeast, if somebody says something about crypto, to just effectively distance from the conversation. You like you crypto, yeah. and, and, and if somebody were to give a, an elaboration of why it might be a good thing, you're effectively you know, banished from the conversation. And that has you know, found its way into the executive branch. So I thought the description of Operation Chokepoint was informative, because what you have there is you have an executive agency um, that, that has taken a moral position that hasn't really been legislated, hasn't been debated in Congress, and they've just decided to kind of pull the file back. So, 
you know, whether or not there's a coordinated action in the executive or there just happens to be a dogma that's starting to percolate um, into the executive branch, you've certainly seen um, a pullback of willingness to um, entertain legitimate uses of blockchain technology. Um, I, I would argue that's problematic from a national security perspective, from an economic perspective, um, from a growth and a tax base perspective. But we'll just put it at there is moral philosophy that is now being legislated effectively through the executive. And as to whether or not crypto is a security or not, you know, it can be a security and it cannot be a security. But the best we have is, you know, statute legislation from 1933 and 1934. Um, the legislative history, which Chair Gensler mentioned in the last few weeks, is actually quite um, fragmented, scant. If you read what the um, people in the room write about the history of, you know, the 1933 Act, a lot of the history wasn't actually collected until much later. And then it turned out that it was mostly Justice Frankfurter, then an attorney, um, and two other people in a room who took the English Companies Act and just kind of slapped a few things together. To me, that does not contemplate um, a trustless you know, ledger-based technology. Number one, it doesn't contemplate computers. Um, number two, it doesn't contemplate international finance at a scale that, that, that is possible now, that certainly wasn't possible in the 1920s, which is what the 1933 Act is really a reaction to. Um, so not one person can say it is a security or it isn't. And in fact, not one working group and not one agency can. There are about 538 people um, plus one uh, who who can make that determination? And so I think for you know those assembled jurists um, that that, that want to think critically about this, I think we've seen the limitations of Chevron deference. I think we've really seen it pushed to the limit, and I expect uh, that that deference is going to reach its limit in the Supreme Court. Now, when we don't know, it, will it be the Coinbase case? We don't know. Will it be Ripple? I can't tell you. But it does not seem, it doesn't pass the, the smell test to say that the 1933 Act really does contemplate everything that could happen in human interaction. Unless you're really going into there's nothing new under the sun. That's not what that Act says, though. I think it's really important to contemplate that. The other thing is taking an originalist perspective on the Act, but then not permitting an original, uh, excuse me, an originalist perspective on the Constitution is a little bit contradictory, but we'll put that aside. So let's talk about what we're seeing beyond the federal level. The dogma has really carried forward. So there's really, you know, if, if you look at current state bills, and I don't even have to pick one, just contemplated legislation, um, you're seeing the legislation effectively make an agency the legislator. So, you know, everyone's familiar with, you know, Article One, necessary and proper, right? Well, now we have statutes that say an agency can make the laws that are necessary and appropriate, fill in definitions as necessary and appropriate, and, and my favorite, necessary or convenient. Um, so you have an agency that is now the legislator, as contemplated in some of the state-level legislation. Uh, you have the agency that is also the qualifier. If you'd like a license, we've made the rule that's necessary or convenient or proper, or whatever word you want to use, for you to come in and register. But now we can move the ball exactly as we would like to um, in order to accommodate a very fleeting political moment, how the public feels about it now. And you can't build any kind of economic infrastructure around how the public feels now. I think you pointed out some excellent examples of bad things that have happened in the crypto markets. There's no denying that there has been excess of malfeasance. Um, there's no denying that too many bad actors have, have crept in. I would argue that a lack of clear regulation created an aperture for that to happen. Um, and, and unfortunately, has also insulated a lot of that behavior from the private enforcement. It's very difficult as a plaintiff's attorney to reach the Cayman Islands, um, particularly with a new technology that you, you don't even quite understand yet. Um, I, I'm a huge advocate of private enforcement. I think that fraud should be rooted out of the market aggressively. Um, plaintiff's attorneys are the best, the best at doing that. 
they can find out when you did something wrong. If you look at a ledger and you have instant access to people, you know, uh, inside trading or um, embezzling, like you can bet if you make it economical, plaintiff's attorneys will take care of that. I know that some people probably don't like the plaintiff's bar a whole lot, but I tend to think that they go where the money is and they tend to do the job of the regulator a lot faster. So I think the way I'd sum this up is we really need to go back to separation of powers. And that's what the crypto asset market and dialogue um, that's going on right now is showing. You, you should not have a you know, chair of an agency sit in front of Congress and feel comfortable deflecting questions like a politician. We saw that, you know, in the early 2000s in you know, political dialogue, when people still actually kind of spoke to each other, um, you know, deflecting the question was a common strategy of avoiding the hard question. But regulators who are tasked with enforcing laws that Congress makes should be able to give yes or no answers. We should not be going to a world where there's a latitude to say, you know, that's just really not a convenient question for me to answer. I don't want to have to recuse myself, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, or even just give that as a reason. Um, but I think the biggest problem, and, and to bring it back to builders, which is my primary focus, um, there are some amazing builders in this market. If you look at, you know, the Stanford catalog, it's been populated with excellent courses that consider governance, that consider, um, you know, mathematical proofs and how they're affecting uh, the transfer of value. Um, and these are incredibly popular classes. Uh, sometimes you have to go where, you know, the, the brain share is going um, and give some latitude for creation. Um, and if you don't, you, you end up really, number one, doing a disservice to the next generation of builders who, you know, I think are phenomenally intelligent um, and committed to the rule of law. I think they would do whatever you said in terms of clear rules, okay, we'll comply. But to have the ability to move the ball and never give clear rules and use dogma instead of you know legislation on behalf of the people, you end up with economic morass, um, you end up with technological decay, and you end up with a lack of rule of law, which is why we're here. I mean, um, uh, the SEC in its briefs always talks about you know, what the, the animating purpose of this legislation is. And uh, inherently flexible and, uh, so, uh, you know, quoting, you know, when, you know, at when. Yeah. Now, I don't think the current Supreme Court majority is going to vote for any of this. So, in, in its ruling, I think they look for intelligible principles of delegation, something more than just the public interest. It's, uh, and they're not likely to sign off uh, the uh, very broad latitude that um, uh, this particular agency has to support its own customers. As the first said, he's sort of like wishing himself into jurisdiction over the entire industry. Uh, so if I, it's not in the statute. It's not in it, the, the expression "crypto." Uh, uh, what is it? Crypto asset securities. They're literally made up. You don't find that in the statute anywhere. They literally made up. But they say it again, repeatedly, repeatedly, as, as if now it's the new category, as if, as if it were in the statute. So if I could just respond briefly to yeah. the, you know, where is this going to go, uh, you know, at the Supreme Court level, you know, I obviously can't speak for the court. Um, but I, I would say it's very telling that, you know, it, it appears that the SEC is in dialogue with, um, I think it's Sean Wahi, um, who was the Coinbase employee who was accused of yeah. effectively insider trading. Um, the facts as they exist, awful, would never endorse that. Um, but Jones Day wrote a very strong brief um, regarding the major questions doctrine. And it seems as though, you know, if you're to treat a complaint as precedent, I think you should also look to where the SEC is settling. And that that um, motion to dismiss, I think, is is the setup. And so if 
ever a case is strong enough mm -hmm. to to you know, reach it reach the Supreme Court. That that brief is the first thing. I mean, you could verbatim refile it, just change the facts. I think that's that's the argument they're up against, and uh, this is not a very hospitable Supreme Court for um, you know an executive dogmatist. That's that is certainly the hope. You know, that, that, that is exciting. <laughs> um, if you want to talk to us, I mean, we're over time. You can leave if you want. You can stick around. But you want to tell us what's going on in Illinois? This is a little bit provincial, but we're all here in Illinois. Sure, sure. I've tried to avoid the question. Um, uh, you know, I, I would say that there are you know, very smart people on both sides of this question. Um, but the current legislation that's under consideration, um, I believe, in the House, uh, is, is comprehensive. It's effectively a licensing statute. Um, it's mixed with the money transmitter um, updates. And so uh, from, a, from an advocacy perspective, there are people who have an interest in the money transmission piece, like you know, credit card companies, for instance, that are totally divorced from the blockchain um, components. But the, the blockchain, the digital asset provision, um, you know, contemplates that the Illinois licensing agency will have a very large role in um, granting licenses to, um, you know, effectively digital asset businesses, which are those that, um, you know, will say transact with Illinois residents. Um, but if you if you draw that language broadly, that could mean almost all of DeFi, unless you geo block Illinois, um, and and. The current kind of contemplated language um, permits the agency to uh, to add to what the definition of digital asset you know, business is, and so that gets to the separation of powers point. Um, how much you know, and and I can't speak to the non delegation principle at the Illinois constitutional level yet, um, but uh, is it going to be the approach of states that kind of follow the executive? along this path of just kind of in, instinctually um, wanting to oppose crypto or opposing it because people have used its name um, very to, to, to very bad end, but not actually have used the technology um, you know, as, yeah. as it's designed. Um, are they going to kind of try to take the infrastructure of DeFi um, down through that, you know, with you know, massive fines uh, for non-licensed activity? That, that may not even be contemplated. There's an entire you know, personal jurisdiction question um, embedded there. But, um, you know, the states, some states seem to be wanting to take a very broad view. Um, and I think it's incumbent on people who care about separation of powers and care about rule of law, both at the state and the federal level, to take notice um, and, and to take you know, the action that they can um, to prevent uh, executive overreach at either level. The states hadn't been a particular problem until this year. Right? I mean, uh, New, except for New York. Well, New York was always a problem. So, so or, 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 New, and New Jersey too. Yeah. New York uh, kind of this reached. Is not just an Illinois thing. Happened. Correct. I mean, this is this is you know it's part of the carpet bombing of the industry at various state legislatures. Right? Well. New York's bill was not particularly well received, but uh, it kind of reached a stasis, and that served as call it the base layer for what um, you know the legislators in Illinois have considered, except that they then enhanced it significantly. Uh, I believe in reaction to you know some some pretty uh, you know bad, effectively commercial frauds that have happened in the name of crypto. Um, but it seems it's to be, to vilify, it's right? very easy to vilify at the moment. Um, it's very unfortunate. It's zeitgeist. Yeah, yeah. It was largely attributable to Sam. Actually. There was a mood change, right? It's always been easy to vilify. That's, well, that's like true. The, the name crypto. You know, drug I, dealers. I don't know who said this, but uh, I'll, I'll say it in Somebody said, look, first they ignore you, 
then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Okay? We're in the fighting stage. Fighting stage right now. I'm still in the laughing stage. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I laugh at some of the NFTs, but I, it's a concept I love. But, uh, you know, we're in the fighting stage. And uh, no one laughs at it so much anymore. I mean, they, you know, but uh, end on that it's a process. No. Yeah. Yes. End on that happy note. You know, we have uh, so many good. Dan, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna David, you want, you want to, you want to uh, call an end to this? Oh well, I, yeah, I don't have any closing comments, but okay. uh, I, 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 do we have at least a, a, a couple of minutes for any questions? Yeah, we can take wanna... questions as long as others will, and uh, I'm not going to push anyone out of here either. I mean, there's you know, still um, there's probably some refreshments. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Yes. I have a question about the long-term viability of cryptocurrency. It seems that a lot of the common consumers are getting involved in this chance to make money because it's unstable. But what consumers want in a currency is something that is stable. I, I get that in this room there are a lot of libertarians concerned about uh, current currency, but is there enough of a demand in America to want to replace our traditional currency to make crypto an actual viable currency on its own? It's, it's, so, uh, it's, all that, yeah, it's Catherine, not a replacement. Think? So some crypto evangelists see crypto as replacing the financial services system. But that's that's the rarity, I would say. Like, obviously, I'm a crypto person. I don't see it as a replacement. It's a complementary asset class. So it's one of many things, my husband's in TradFi, he's a crypto skeptic. We argue all the time about how much Bitcoin I'm buying on any given day. But I see it as diversification. And the other thing that I love about the sustainability and the long-term viability of crypto is statistically, if you look at who's buying crypto, it's young. So, you know, the average 18 year old is far more comfortable with crypto than the average 68 year old. So that's just, you know, natural progression and comfort with this as an asset class, as diversification, as a hedge against a centralized party manipulating currency. I mean, just as an anecdote, I once one of my large matters was representing an FX broker who became undercapitalized as a result of the Swiss government saying, we're not going to pull the peg, we're not going to pull the peg. Then they pulled the peg. You know, so you look at, you know, we can talk all about corrupt centralized parties, but there's also centralized parties that have an, have an enormous amount of power that doesn't exist with a decentralized cryptocurrency. And well, I would I would note that I, I sort of attack a bit of the assumption that crypto doesn't have to, to succeed ultimately as a currency, it doesn't have to immediately become as good as the U.S. dollar. It can move up a variety of rungs. Uh, as pointed out, it can be a hedge. Gold is, I think, 14 trillion cap. It's got a lot of room to run. Uh, already it's quite competitive as a currency in a place like Venezuela, and there are a lot of cu currencies between Venezuela and the United States. So while I, I'm not at all clear it will become a currency, the question I think is this long-term prospects is climbing. And the way it climbs is to, is to be propelled both in vol value and to decrease in volatility. And actually, if you look at the volatility of, of Bitcoin, for instance, the, the one currency that rules them all, um, I think uh, it, it has gone down in volatility. It, it, is, it is still quite volatile, but it is less volatile than when it began. And so that is a possibility, I think, uh, of the, climbing those rungs to become potentially a competitive currency. And piggy oh, go ahead. Uh, piggybacking off that, I, I think we're also just in a very fortunate position to be in the world's largest economy where we have the world's arguably strongest currency. When you look at people who are like refugees leaving the conflict in Ukraine, you can't really like carry your bundle of rubles over the border easily and then be able to spend it in Poland or Germany when you could have a USB stick that's your hardware wallet and you're carrying crypto that you can then go ahead and convert your new place into currency that's usable there. And, and I would, I was just going to say one 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 point. Uh, 
from the perspective of the Federal Reserve, uh, about six years ago, uh, an economist, the, guy, the economist of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, charged with learning about crypto, uh, gave a little program to a bunch of economists, and I asked him uh, whether he feared, uh, there was any fear that uh, the Fed could lose control of the money supply because of crypto. At least six, six, seven years ago, the response was, are you kidding? It's such a small factor. It could never affect our ability to control the money supply. So that was their perspective, at least. It may, be, it may be out of date, but it was interesting. They, they, they just they were very dismissive of it. USDC is worth a dollar. It'll be worth a dollar tomorrow and a dollar the day after that, a dollar the day after that. Okay? That's currency and it is a crypto asset. There are people, one of the reactions to US government hostility, this is minority so far, but it's a trend, are crypto people who live only in This is a growing trend. I will trade in various crypto assets and I'll use stable coins to buy stuff. I need to buy stuff, you know, goods and services from the country. The great advantage the US government has, the U US dollar has, is you have to pay your taxes to the US dollar. But that's the only thing that you need US dollars for. Everything else is whatever the vendor will. A lot of crypto companies pay their employees in crypto. I mean, Maple offered our, our employees the option of being paid yeah. in USDC or fiat. Yeah. Our incentive comp was in crypto. I, I, I think Bitcoin is here to stay. It, it held, I don't know, several hundred million of people now have some exposure to Bitcoin. That's not going away. I mean, it may flow offshore more. So if the U.S. government makes it, you know, I suppose if you get the But that would upset a lot of congressmen and senators. Yes. And I'll, sorry. Lady in the back. No, no, go ahead. Oh, Dan. Crypto assets is merely an application of the technology, mm -hmm. right? The technology is growing by leaps and bounds, right? My, I, in a prior panel, I predicted in 10 years, high school students will have the opportunity to take computer science classes that focus on blockchain. Right, my kids are going to think Bitcoin is this antique rotary right. phone. Right, um, right. So that's where it's going. How that, what path it's going to take, I have no idea. But that's where it's going. And, 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 and the next fiat currency, the next currency that will emerge, will be a digital asset. There's no doubt. It's not going to be Where, wherever. It's just not going to be. What question?
percent. Dan address that to some degree it's hard to determine that all of this all of these are securities when the CFTC is saying some of them are commodities so you know some entities are taking the, the position that they're all securities and I understand that approach 100% I saw something fantastic the other day where allegedly there was some interest from FTX in granting Taylor Swift a 100 million dollar endorsement deal and Taylor herself was the one who said, I'm not comfortable because they can't prove they're not securities, which I'm, I'm not a Swifty. That made me want to be a Swifty. But, you know, so it's a conservative approach. There's an enormous lack of clarity. But, you know, I'll turn it to Dan. I, I think you should comment based on your earlier comments. No, look, there, there's, you know, like, like I said, there is an enormous amount of lack of clarity coming out of the SEC, right? Like I said, the, the one time the commission has addressed the question, which is footnote 29 of the uh, investment advisor rule, they say, well, we think most things are a security, and they cite Howie. That's it. That's all we can work off of. Uh, because, you know, th th they'll, they'll, they'll cite to a staff ad, uh, advisory that came out four years ago that listed, you know, pick your way of counting 40-some-odd factors. But you got to read the footnote. The first footnote in that document says, this is staff's view. This is not the view of the commission, right? So even that document doesn't tell you what the commission's view is on the issue, right? And so you have to look to. Yeah, APs, yes. The, the, the Another new term by the SEC. We, we can be paying attention to some of this stuff, but I'll offer you a couple of points about that. One is, I think most people who work with developers would acknowledge that in the early stages of the protocol and the token, it probably is a security. Um, uh, uh, for starters, okay? I mean, I always do. I assume it's a security. You know, as it's just getting underway. And that's not a problem because you sell things that don't have a token. Mm -hmm. So, sure, but there are ways to sell them, but you have to assume there was some security early on. Um, uh, now, over time, it can mutate into a non security more, yeah, in, in two ways. <coughs> One is it becomes decentralized, the other way is that it becomes. Hard, there is a paradox. It's hard to become decentralized or fully functional without making a public offering, but you cannot make a public offering in the United States on a daily basis for a business. The way you manage it is to treat it as a security within the United States and treat it as a become decentralized. That takes time and planning and skill. Don't try this at home, Joe. Right. This is that takes a lot of planning and skill and a runway. It requires a runway of at least a year, probably two years or longer. The SEC is advantaging all the cases it brought, without exception, against particular tokens, has been they've gone after ones that were created in 2016, 2017, which was the height of the ICO boom when all of the learning that I just gave you didn't exist. 
Okay. After the ICO boom, lawyers said, oh, there's a couple ways that we can do this and we won't be secured. So we started to apply to developers along the way. They said, well, do you have to see it? Can somebody do those? Not yet. Okay. They've gone after the early, they've gone after the Model A and the Model B, which don't run at the speed of Ferrari. That's it. But early stage, yeah, it's probably a security. But the grown up question is how can we make it not a security as a And there's some great work being done at the world. You just talk to the <laughs> So so Pat on that yeah. note, I think that yeah. we'll probably take any more questions out of the social hour, but I want to thank yeah. our panelists for an outstanding program this evening. That's probably true. Yeah.